Hello everybody and thank you so much for spending time with me again today. I'm very, very excited to be speaking to Lorraine Jenks today, who is an environmentalist who specializes in sustainable living. So Lorraine, over to you. How did you get into this field? How did you become an environmentalist? And uh, what is it about it that drives you? I think I was actually born an empath, which is a terrible thing because I feel the pain of everything. Mm. And plants, animals, insects, no matter anything that's suffering, always, since I was a tiny little girl, fought to the underdog. Um, and you have to look at what your passion is. That's the sort of thing that would keep me awake. You know, if I had a vision of elephants being tortured in Thailand before I go to sleep, there's no way I'm going to sleep. Mm. So it's actually, a, it's, a, it's a problem. And then I did my usual gap year, went to London, uh, ended up in Canada, ended up in California, right in the middle of the hippie era. Wonderful, where we inhaled our herbs mm. and worked for the Environmental Protection Agency, which is brand, brand new. And that gave me the, the courage to actually start making that part of my work. Mm. So through all the years after that, I, I always tried to implement greener, um, choices when I could, came back to South Africa and ended up doing the procurement for one of our, the biggest um, hotel chain in Africa. And all my contracts, I would slowly, I re, you know, the trouble I was way ahead, the people actually didn't know what I was talking about. Mm. And every product that I had to work on and sign a contract for, I would try and encourage them to be more eco-conscious. Mm. Um, and of course they honestly they didn't know what I was talking about mm. and then I was very fortunate because it was such early days then I'm talking about oh, 30 years ago mm. um, the Al Gore did his first training um, for climate change um, leaders he calls us and it was of course here in Johannesburg that was amazing once I'd done that course and it was formalized and it was official and I could put it on my, my letterheads, um, it gave me permission mm -hmm. to be seen as authentic and actually start teaching and lecturing on, on climate change, running workshops. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Very, and, and you know, when you're doing the right thing for the right reasons, there's no money in it, just warn everybody, there's no money in it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually a Montessori teacher by profession. And when, when I left the hotel uh, chain in a half, because they just honestly weren't going to listen, after 15 years of me trying to get them just to start recycling, um, and they started calling me back. And that's what happens to you. I would just give, I'm a teacher, just give an ordinary little lecture at, say, Southern Sun or Intercontinental or whatever, to the heads of department on how to be greener when they're in, in their operations and in their procurement. Um, and I would see some of the faces going, what is she talking about? Mm. The maintenance man would hear me and the um, food and beverage people who would hang on to every word I said. And I realized they had to, they were hoteliers. Mm. They had to see, feel and touch what I was talking about. Mm. And in a moment of absolute madness, my bookkeeper and I booked 100 square meters at the host ex exhibition. Mm. <laughs> We'd never done anything like that. And I had, a, I had an online directory that I developed, like a Yellow Pages. We don't sell anything. We just, it's just a, um, a, a portal for people to find things. Uh, and the, the green one's called Green Stuff. And we just asked everybody on Green Stuff to send us stuff mm. to furnish a mock hotel in 100 square meters to show that you mm. could furnish a whole hotel from front to back with only eco-friendly products. Mm. And then Decorex discovered us and asked us to do the same with Decorex. And we've never looked back since then. We've built so many projects like that just to demonstrate. Um, often I have to use money out of my pension. Mm. And then the people um, lend us their goods to display on their behalf. And they've been an enormous success, even retrospectively. Mm. I've, I've won awards for them. Some of those awards are 10 years after the event when people mm. say, gosh, this is actually what the girls were trying to do. Mm. So mm. very encouraging now at long last it's actually a 50-year journey i was in california in 1969 mm. um and it's it, you know it's it's such a thrill now to see people um beginning to understand and i think covid 
um, the virus has been such a wake-up call because that is, I think, a dress rehearsal mm. for what's coming with climate change. Mm -hmm. and, and you say you saw this coming way ahead of many others. What do you think gave you that insight? Gosh, I, I think just being, you know, women are much better at this than men. And of course, uh, the, most of that head office was men. Mm. Who'd pat me on my head in the boardroom and go, Oh, I like a green queen, you're worried about the bunny, you know? And I'd, I said, Please, <laughs> let's not use the clean chemicals, they're full of toxins. You're yes. using them in, in, in the Drakensberg, you're using them in the Kruger Park. Yes. You know, and um, I honestly don't think anyone is being delinquent. Uh, mm. I think they, we, have a, we have a greater sense of our impact on everything we do, everything we buy, everything we use, everything we eat and our lifestyle. I think women instinctively actually know and in the early days no one was actually putting it in writing except for um, the book that actually was to change my life was Silent Spring mm -hmm. um, where they spoke about DDT. That was a long time ago. That was in the uh, mid-60s that book was written. That was the first time people actually looked to see what pesticides for example were doing to our whole um, the whole environment, the whole ecology, the whole balance of biodiversity. You know, you, you damage one little thing in, in an ecosystem and it, it, it has a ripple effect. It affects mm. everything else eventually. Mm. Um, so I, it, it took time. I think a lot of them still don't understand. If you look at the countries that uh, have coped the best with, with COVID-19, it's been the ones with female presidents. Mm -hmm. And you look at uh, Greta Thunberg, she's a girl. You look at that woman, I forget her name, who headed the United Nations when they were doing the Paris Accord, working, she's a woman. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, it'll happen, we must just not be cross with them. Mm -hmm. They just don't have, you know, you, you, wanna, you, you want to buy a new house, you see an old house and you're walking with your husband and you say, let's take this wall out and they're going, what are you talking about? Women have a different vision. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's you, you, you almost want to legislate because it's taking too long, but mm. that doesn't work. Pointing fingers and blaming and shaming does not work. Mm. Um, mm. They have to start actually experiencing um, what you're talking about in, in real time. Mm. Mm. So what do you think will work? You say experience. Yeah, it's very difficult to say. There's a thing called uh, blending, divestment. Uh, I watched a real big workshop yesterday. If you've got investments, you have got to divest from any investment that is in the fossil fuel industry, any of the big oil companies, you have got to divest. Mm. And then, you know, on, on a personal level, people will say, what can I do? You can do all these things like plastic straws and put in LED lights and ride a bicycle and shower with a friend. You can do all those things. It's not enough. Do mm. it. Do it because it might reach critical mass, but it'll be much too slow. What we have to do is start motivating from, um, from the ground up. We've got to start nagging, protesting, boycotting to, to aim at the politicians, mm. who are the decision makers, and the mm. big industries. Mm. And the only way the big industries are going to listen is if it hurts their pocket. Mm. So we've got to start, as I said, divesting from them and also um, stop buying their products. Mm. Learn what is bad, for example, palm oil. Mm. Um, palm oil in itself is not bad at all. It's the way they're chopping down the forests for uses where it doesn't have to be palm oil. It could be a, a different oil. Mm. Um, so that's the two big things. The politicians and the big industries have got to go for them flat out. And it's got to be enormous. It's got to be an enormous global um, shift in thinking mm. um, if we're going to make a difference in time. Mm. Because we've only actually got until 2030, definitely mm. until 2050 to get down to zero, um, what they call greenhouse gas emissions. And that is a hell of a big ask. And we can do it. If we could get the whole planet to lock down for a little ho ho, this, you can't even see it, it's so small. Mm. If, the, if humanity can actually lock down for that, they can jolly well act on climate change and mm. make some of these decisions if we want to survive. Mm. Mm. And, and, uh... What what would you say? Because I feel in South Africa we've we've got kind of a challenge with so much unemployment and with a, a, a leadership that really should be focusing on job creation and that kind of thing. 
how do you how do you uh, then kind of motivate people who are trying to create a, a more efficient capitalist system to you know, to not I, engage yeah i guess to be a just transition in south africa and our challenge is far more severe than um, elsewhere and uh, you know, if you, I'm going to run a course, actually, Melanie, you must let your people know on the latest, the very latest statistics and opinions on climate change. Mm. Uh, it's a little bit academic, but people need to see all that stuff. They need to see the graphs and things as well, even if they don't relate to them. Mm. Um, I mean, they put stories in just to make it more entertaining and a bit of humor and some rude pictures. Um, but now I've lost my train of thought. What did you ask me? Um, I was I was asking about our challenge here in South Africa. Oh yes, the just transition. <laughs> you know, people are saying it's true. Uh, when you see Al Gore's entire training program, renewables are now more are cheaper now than coal. Mm. In fact, and there's enormous opportunities for jobs. The the jobs aren't only being able to install a solar panel or uh, put up a wind turbine. There are a host of other jobs in zoology, marine biology, everything that is uh, climate change is affecting, there's work in that in that field. Um, but the renewables in South Africa, we must just be careful, they are going to be cheaper, definitely, definitely, but we can't just start um, um, retiring and, and retrenching people left, right and center. But having said that, I spoke at one of the biggest coal companies in the country and I was amazed at what they're actually doing. You know, they don't talk about this enough. They're doing incredible stuff. It was the greenest, enormous uh, um, event conference. It was absolutely huge that I have ever been to. And they're doing wonderful stuff quite quietly on the side to one day hopefully shift from coal to, um, to renewable. Mm. Um, just slowly, slowly. Uh, and, you know, there's a wonderful link on the World Wildlife foundation on their website on careers possible careers and people must start looking for those look ahead don't mm. look at the obvious careers look ahead there's going to be and even strange things that you haven't thought of even things like conflict resolution there's going to be so much conflict because of things like um, uh, famine migration we haven't begun to see the migration of people who are starving mm. you're going to have to have some people trained in those skills on starting uh, what we call regenerative farming. Farm everywhere, plant vegetables absolutely everywhere mm. so that these people can be fed. Um, so it's not just the obvious. Um, be creative and try and think if it's 30 years from now, what are gonna be the worst case scenarios and where could I perhaps have work that would be um, helpful? Mm. Mm. That's, that's a wonderful insight. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, so I've, I've started a, a group on Facebook um, that's gone viral, well, in a small way. We've got 66,000 members. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've got 66,000 and I think that's a lot. Yeah. Well and done. Thank you. And thank you. So um, my, my field has always been textiles. So we specifically speak about textiles and how textiles really should be a resource that are used and reused and reused instead of viewed as a single use item that gets thrown away when it's got a little hole in it. Um, what's been interesting to me about that group is how many people are ready to shift and change their minds. Do you feel that worldwide we, we are ready to make the mind shift or do you think that it really is still just a minority of people who are aware? It's definitely a minority of people. Um, and there is so much greenwashing. You know, greenwashing is just where you pretend you're green and then if you actually look, they're not green at all. Mm. You know, they have pictures of bamboo shoots on the labels of their products and it's full of toxins. Um, but the shift, it's, it's not negligible at all, you know, they're starting to do, I think we have to start um, with fast fashion mm. and there's a shift there, mm. uh, hopefully not, not with the majority of middle income people in America, they just, they haven't been taught to think, mm. they're not bad, they're not delinquent, you can't point fingers at people, they haven't been taught to stop and think, do I have to have this? Mm. How long can I use it? What happens to it when I've, I'm finished with it? Mm. 
Mm. Um, and once they, you know, if you, you stand back at anything, look at the textile, you've got to look at the whole life cycle of anything, your mm. cell phone, your motor car, the food that you're eating. And that fabric, let's look at a piece of fabric. Where did it come from? Mm. Did it damage a forest somewhere? Did it damage uh, the ind indigenous people? You know, were they, were they um, their land taken away? Um, and then how far did it travel? How is it manufactured? Does it pollute? I mean, the, the pollution of fabrics in the, in the Far East are hideous. The rivers are running with the dyes from the fabrics that are being treated in the factories. Um, and then, you know, how far does it travel to, to the retail outlet? How is it sold while you're using it? And then the most important thing is how do you get rid of it? Mm. And one of the other things is how long does it last? Mm. And one of the examples, especially being in the hotel, so busy originally, we're in every industry now, but originally in the hotel and hospitality industry, you cannot get a, a procurement officer in a hotel to buy flax because mm. it's so expensive. But they don't know in Italy, you buy flax bed linen in an antique shop. It gets more beautiful the older it gets. Mm. It stops being pure white. But it is softer and more silky the more you wash it now it lasts for generations mm -hmm. so they have to look in in most industries they have to look at this month's bottom line what did it cost me mm -hmm. to kit out this hotel with bed linen mm -hmm. so we have to start looking at things like which I'm, i know you know i've been looking at your website at things like hemp mm -hmm. it has to be organic cotton mm -hmm. bamboo won't stand up to industrial washing but my goodness it's wonderful you know it, it's such a beautiful soft fabric um and then Look at the life, how long it's going to last. Hemp will last something like eight to ten times longer than linen. Mm. Polyester is plastic. I have a huge thing about recycling plastic. It is an absolute hoax. It mm. is an absolute scam. And even people like Greenpeace are saying that now. Don't listen to them about recycling. We support it now because it's the only thing we've got. It's all we've got. Mm. But we have to replace it. If we can send a man to the moon... Mm. We can jolly well invent something that replaces uh, plastic, even mm. hemp. Anything that's made out of plastic could actually be made out of hemp plastic, for example. Mm. Mm. Um, so these, the, this is about recycling something into a shopping bag from PET bottles. It's nonsense. It's still plastic. Mm. That, that, that bag's still got to get rid of somehow. It's going to end up in landfill or in the sea, without, mm. without doubt. Um, and then, you know, in the fashion industry as well, it's plastic no matter what you do with it. If you turn it into a a windbreaker later on it's still plastic mm. um but you the the you know it's one of the big chains i always forget their name they started this business about send your clothes back to us we'll recycle them just follow it it's nonsense mm. follow what they're actually doing one of the big um, fashion houses is doing renting that is brilliant mm. Mm. and these are these places are springing up now where you you all the people with the really expensive designer clothes they wear them two or three times to an event take it to these shops this quality is very high mm. and they, that's becoming a thing to use secondhand uh designer clothing again and again you wear it a few times take it back someone else can get uh, pleasure out of it and they get a sort of a, like a shabby chic look mm. some of them can actually like leather can actually look the older they get the more sort of um, stylish they are because of something they stand for quality mm. top quality mm. um but it's it's a it's a challenge we've got to stop people from i think COVID's going to do that lots of us have realized hey i mean i've got my jeans on today because there are people on my balcony with <laughs> i can't bear this tight waistband mm. because i've been wearing loose leggings uh, with lockdown Mm -hmm. A lot of people realize how few clothes they need mm -hmm. and how unimportant it is to have a, a, a wardrobe of what's currently in fashion for those few months mm -hmm. for that season. Um, so, I mean, I have hope that it will change. It's just, and I'm hoping that we're gonna, it's going to start moving a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. But as you said, it's still a minority that think that way. They see cheap. If you, anything, if you see anything that's cheap, Google Bangladesh, Google mm. the factories, he, the children that are working, see it's literally slave labor. Mm. So if a t-shirt costs you 80 rand, there's a reason it costs 80 rand. Mm. Rather wait and buy one that costs 200 rand made from beautiful organic cotton, made in a factory where people are, play, are paid properly. Rather have one mm. 
with the word kindness, apply the word kindness to anything that was manufactured with kindness to the soil where the cotton was grown and where there are no pesticides, the way that cotton was grown, the way that cotton was picked, woven and how and who made that t-shirt for you. Mm -hmm. I find there's there's an extreme disconnect in that respect uh, that people don't connect that a cheap item very likely was attached to a slave labor practice somewhere across the world. And I find that's one of the most difficult conversations to have with people. Um, you know, so, so many people get, kind of get home and want to pat themselves on the back when they've bought a whole bunch of things for a small amount of money. And, and they don't realize that, that the implication is that somebody on the other side of the world has suffered uh, for their saving. Yeah, and you know, I think another thing that COVID's done for us, I, I've got a workshop that I developed in early days of lockdown um, on the parallels between climate change and COVID-19 and the lessons that we've learned. And one of the lessons we've learned is going back to the way things used to be. Making bread. God, when last did I make bread? I mean, what fun. You've got time. You're stuck at home. You don't have to go out and wait for something. It, you just do it in the house. Making your own clothes. People, I think, are starting. And, and like your tie dyeing. Why not do it yourself? Mm. Get a piece of fabric or get something that you've worn 100 times and you're sick of it. Mm. Turn it into something completely new. Mm. Or mend it. People have started mending things. They've got time. Why must I go out and go and buy a new pair of whatever? Let mm. me just get that needle cotton and fix it. And I think there also there's a lot of positive there where people have gone back to the old way of, mm. of, of doing things and turning something into upcycling it is the word, mm. uh, which is on your website. Well, I was so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> people are starting to think like that. And it's and COVID, thank you to the virus, because previously we were too busy with that old normal. Just, uh, we were all too busy herring around. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So do you feel that COVID has, has brought us to a standstill so that there is time to, to think and reflect on these things? COVID has sent us to our room, to, our, to the naughty step, mm. and said, you go and sit there now and you start thinking about what you've been doing. Step back and have a look. And when you come out of this, I call it the new abnormal, there are going to be major paradigm shifts you know, my, my age, I'm 77 now, I've seen so much, man, Medlin, you know, and I've seen so many trends, and I'm very Aquarian, if you believe in those things. I always can sort of see, like I did a crime long before anybody else, I always have a sense of what's coming, and then I definitely sense an enormous paradigm shift towards, um, there's not a wrong and a right way of doing things. Nothing's 100% wrong or 100% right. Mm -hmm. There's a better way to do things. So anything you do, anything you build or buy or wear or whatever, if you have to make a decision, there's the old decision, mm -hmm. and then there's the new way of uh, doing that thing a better way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, they make it so complicated. It's, not, it's so, actually so simple. Once you understand the basics of what A makes an eco-friendly product, or what climate change actually is, what causes it, mm. and what its impacts are. It's basic. Once you understand those basics, it's really easy to step mm. back and say, look, I've got two or three choices here. Which is the, which is the best? And choose the, the best of those, of those choices. Mm. So it's almost about slowing down in the moment when you need to make the decision and just thinking again. Yeah, yeah which we've done sitting here in our, in our homes. Mm. No, baking, baking bread. No, you. But you know what? It's it's also. I mean, Zoom. God in heaven. I'm so sick of Zoom, and I'm totally addicted. You know? <laughs> there's, there's something every day that I think, oh, this is so interesting. I've got to watch this. It's <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. So you've you've mentioned some worst case scenarios. Um, and I think it might be worth talking about worst case scenario just so that people can get a sense of what's at stake. You know, you've got to have, um, sorry, I, I, I told you I, have, I saw a dermatologist yesterday and I've got these spots on my face where they burn things off. Um, you know what you have to do? You've got to make it real. And I have to give, when I'm talking about the impact of climate change, especially I, I've done special research on the impact in Africa because Africa is very different. And the impact on our agriculture, for example, our indigenous people, um, 
And, you know, we, we're half asleep. Tourism's half asleep in South Africa. We've got to prepare, we've got to adapt. If we don't adapt, we're not going to make it. The animals are moving, animals and plants are moving 14 feet every day away from the equator. So any uh, forest are growing further, wherever they is moving away from the heat to where it's, where it's cooler. They're moving north and they're on the hemisphere south. Animals are migrating slowly, 14 feet every day away from the equator. Mm. And then the, the example that I give when we go through the usual things like the, the polar caps melting and the sea rising, all these things are measurable. All, people are really experiencing all these things. Obviously, the droughts and the famines, the floods, the hurricanes, they've always been there, mm. but they are far worse. That's the thing. They are more often and they are much more extreme. And then the example I give, um, 18 months ago, I think it was, I was giving a talk in Cape Town. I was staying in Centurion City um, in that lovely hotel and, the, uh, and we were, the event was in the conference center across the road. And they had that monster storm. I mean, it was, we were locked in that hotel for two days and two nights. You could not walk. You could not drive a car. All the aeroplanes were grounded. Mm. Um, the trains, had, by then, you couldn't even get onto the trains and they'd gone. That wind was incredible. You could not stand up. It was impossible to push you right over. You have to experience those winds in Cape Town to know how bad they are. So I was stuck in my room. They'd upgraded me for some reason. I had a beautiful room at the top on the corner. It was glass. It was like, it was like being in, a, in, a, in a, a car wash. This wind and this rain outside that window. I was freezing to death. So I put on all my clothes. And that very same night, I couldn't sleep. I got a, a text message. I got a WhatsApp message from a friend of mine in Eisner. And her house was burning down. So this was this monster storm. And that terrible fire and this is both exacerbated by climate change and she was stuck at the top of a hill in her car and surrounded by fire mm. and she had to drive through this fire down to get down to the beach and picked up a lady with a parrot and a, uh, a woman with a dog on the way down that was the same night and that um, just I think it was a few weeks before after my daughter was in Paris on holiday with her baby and her husband and they had that um, heat wave it was so hot, instead of sightseeing, they were finding fountains to dip the baby in, to cool the baby down. And this is the sort of thing that's going to happen. On your cell phone now in, in, in France, there's an app. So if you get there and there's a heat wave, you, you log into that app and it, 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 it GMSs you, sees where you are. And then it will say, bleep, it's time for you to cool down. There's a library on your left, or there's a park around the corner, or there's a supermarket where there's a, an air conditioner. Go in there for a few minutes. You go in, and then it says, bleep, bleep. You've had a, enough time to cool down. Just check on the old folks, and you can carry on with your sightseeing. Mm. So those are real things. Those are real things that are actually happening. Mm. And, you know, if you've got a property on the coast, um, not so, well, actually, eventually Cape Town Table Mountain will be an island, but that's in the very far distant future. But there are places around uh, Miami and um, elsewhere where you can't insure your property on the coast. You can't sell it and you can't give it away because the sea is rising so fast that they are being inundated. Mm -hmm. And the biggest danger of that, I mean, it's all very well the sea coming up and flooding your place. It is also flooding the underground water. The aquifers are fresh water. Mm -hmm. Places like Cape Town, we are desperately need that underground water. It's getting um, uh, salt water in it from the sea infiltrating. Mm. Um, so those are the real things that may, people must be able to feel them themselves, otherwise they don't hear you. They have what we call cognitive dissonance. They switch off. They don't want to hear it. Mm. So if it's something that's affected them or a friend in real time, mm. that's when they're going to say, my goodness, we actually have to take this seriously. Now. I mean, I sound so depressed. I'm not so depressed. <laughs> I think you've got to be the world's biggest optimist because you 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 take a real look at the numbers and still you remain hopeful that humanity yeah, but will we, change. We're resilient. We'll, we'll, it will be very different. You know, 50 years from now, we won't. Things will have happened we haven't even thought of. Mm -hmm. So, if there are people watching who want to become activists and who want to become more active citizens of the globe 
to, to do more to support what's happening. What would you say? Where should they start? Contact me. Send me okay. an email. I'll put them in touch with the right people. And then follow you. Once you start following something, on uh, Facebook's very good for this. I'm not interested in what you had for breakfast. And I've seen your baby once it's enough. But, you know, for things like this, it's very good. Uh, join people or follow people like Greenpeace, like um, uh, 350.org is uh, anything to do with um, climate change, deforestation, um, green gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, or CO2, call it that if you want. Start joining all these things and through them, one of the, you can't do everything. I try to do everything, which is bloody ridiculous. Um, just find something that really speaks to you and then start following that. And in no time at all, you will build up a network of interested people, mm. courses that you can take, um, webinars that you can, can sit in on, research that you can do, and then you'll find a niche that suits you and that you wake up every morning and you can't wait to get started because it's what you are and what your passion is uh, and, and actually leave a legacy of having at least done something how big or how small to to try and make a difference and i tell you they it's a wonderful um the, the greenies we call ourselves the greenies um the, the nicest people to work with really because they they're good people mm. Mm. that's an yeah. awesome message thank you thank you for telling people because i know as i often speak to people who say this thing is so big um i can't yes. do anything so they just give up and then, you know, look, I've got two websites. I've got three websites, actually. I've got my speaking website, which is LorraineJenks.com. And then I've got two, which is actually, it was never meant to be. It was supposed to be a hobby when I left Southern Sun and I moved to Cape Town and remarried in my 60s, which is a big mistake. You must just rather be on your own. Don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a... All the people, when I worked for the hotel chain, I had all these wonderful suppliers that I worked with, uh, and they really were great. And I would often get calls in my office saying, oh, man, who do you use for this? And I couldn't tell them because ethically we'd done so much research into, say, that type of bed or whatever. So we put it all on the internet like a Yellow Pages directory. It's called Hotel Stuff, and it's way past hotels now. Hospitals use us, government uses us designers, architects, everyone uses it. It's like a yellow page. We don't sell anything. Don't take commission on anything. And then after I did the training with our goal on climate change, I thought now people will understand. So that website's 25, 20 years old, I think. I, I created a link to it called Green Stuff. So anybody who's interested, go on to greenstuff.coza. Uh, also, it's all free. Anything there, nothing's 100% green. Is the greenest that we could find. Look for stuff. Just go through it. Look, say, hey, man, I can do this, or I can do better than this. And mm -hmm. if you know anybody who um, is making something in their garage and trying to be um, sustainable or regenerative or green or whatever you want to call it, eco-friendly, let us know. And we put them onto that website. We get 33,000 people use it every single month. Wow. Just like Yellow Pages, looking for something. And we put lots of people on free. Mm. Um, if it's a, if it's something innovative, and, and they're fantastic stories. There's a, little, a woman we met once in the, uh, you know, the houses in Great, and some of them on the on the right on the pavement, and she was working on a little machine, making beautiful mosquito nets by hand. Mm. And I said, "You, these are lovely. They must come onto my website. You know, what is your email address?" I don't know, ma'am. She says, "I don't have, uh, it, I don't have email." I said, "What's your cell phone number?" No, I don't have a cell phone. She says, but I have a lady who's a Rotarian that helps me. Mm. So I said, give me her number. And then what I did was, and I don't know who uses those websites, you know, like the Yellow Pages, we don't know who uses it. They just, they're free to use. I put my phone number on, I made her a page of her, her, her mosquito nets with my phone number. You know who phoned for those mosquito nets? Sir Richard Branson and his housekeeper. Wow. Isn't that a lovely wow. story? Wow. That's just a little lady making something small, something green. Um, it was recycled fabrics, by the way. Mm. Yeah, so anyone who's interested, go to that website, get some ideas, and then contact me, uh, mm. and we and I'll point you in the right direction. Okay, that's fantastic. That's work to be done. Yeah. So it's green, you, yeah. greenstuff.co.za. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, and it links back to a website called Hotel Stuff, this year, because and then if you want, you know, I specialize in um, green procurement mm. uh, and supply chain management and obviously climate change. Um, mm. And also now the circular economy is, thank goodness, thank goodness, a lot of greenwashing there, but at least people are beginning to stop and think. Um, so if you want anyone to give a talk, uh, often I speak for free, but I also have to eat. Sometimes yes. I charge the people to, to speak. I'll come and run a course for you, do training or just give a, a keynote or whatever. Mm. and share mm. share what I've learned in all these years. You, know? you have such an inspiring story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today, Lorraine. I, I feel very privileged to have spoken to you. Thank you for your time. It was lovely, man. Yeah, where are you? Where do you? Where are you based? I'm in Uniondale at the moment. Oh, you got snow there. Yes, the uh, day before yesterday I woke up to snow, but the rain has washed it all away again, so but it was quite magical. Yeah, I actually had planned, I was going to speak in Cape Town, I had this wonderful trip planned right down Garden Route to see my friends in Nisda and Plet. so it's all been cancelled because of lockdown. So as soon as I do that again, you are going to buy me some coffee. Fantastic, I'd love that. I'd love to have another conversation with you. Thank you so very much.